Are you here? Yes, uh, I think it's time to uh, uh, start a second lecture from uh, Philip Block, um, uh, NCCR, uh, Suresh. It's a great honor for us to invite our uh, close friend, long-term friend, Philip Block. I think uh, he is one of the most important pioneer around the world uh, to uh, uh, give us very special integration between architecture discipline and uh, uh, structure engineer discipline, I think, which is super important, especially leading us to the new uh, digital uh, fabrication futures, which should be especially based on the knowledge uh, of these two di disciplines. I think um, over the past uh, uh, 10 years, actually, we reached a uh, feedback and invite him coming to Shanghai uh, several times, I think, which uh, gave us a uh, super important influence. And I think his uh, contribution, not only to Zurich, uh, actually his research, um, uh, including uh, open source uh, Rhino Vault, every student um, use Rhino and uh, uh, you, you, you already uh, uh, use uh, Rhino Vault a lot uh, from your bachelor degree, bachelor studios. I think that's the uh, uh, the developer is from uh, Philip Block's team. I think he, based on his uh, PhD thesis, uh, uh, I I really uh, 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 like and appreciate uh, Philip Block's uh, 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 leadership because uh, he actually leading right now the NCCR in Zurich and especially. It's a team uh, uh, sharing uh, the knowledge with the world, firstly. And secondly, I think uh, 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 the next time, maybe the lecture on the Compass, which is a sharing platform, software platform. I really appreciate, I think, uh, which is um, a very uh, new concept uh, to for the sharing knowledge and especially for the community, not one university. I think uh, uh, that is super, super important. Today, I think uh, Feedblock will especially focus on the one of uh, his most contribution and his research on the graphic aesthetics. That is like a, a, a very important uh, tradition, but actually profound and uh, newly developed by a lot of teams around the world. Uh, graphic aesthetics actually uh, 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 leading us going to the digital in architecture, I think, uh, which have a lot of possibility and also give uh, high performance uh, buildings a new approach. I think. Uh, that is a super fundamental, important fu fundamental knowledge to all of us. So let's and give the screen to Philip and uh, uh, for the, we're looking forward uh, to lecture. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, thanks, thanks Philip for again, a very, very nice and uh, complimentary uh, introduction. Um, as, as indeed announced uh, today, uh, I want to give you some basics on the graphic statics um uh, i am fully aware that it will be a lot of material and that you will not fully understand everything after today's lecture but at the end you will see that i that we have uh, built up as a group quite a lot of uh, online resources that allow you to really dive in to to teach yourself also um, to use tools to discover more aspects of graphic statics in the um, in the summaries that you have gotten of, of, of the lectures, I call it graphic statics, white box structural design. And what I meant by that is white box is the opposite of uh, black box. And black box means that a tool, a technique is kind of hidden within a solver, for example, um, uh, let's say a, a finite elemental uh, analysis solver, for example, like Caramba, like, like uh, Sophistix, whatever so, uh, uh, software that you use, and you actually don't know exactly what's going on. And so you will see that graphic statics allows you really to understand the relation between uh, form and forces, right? And so that's, that's, that will be the topic for today. <clears throat> All right. Ah, there we go. So introduction. So graphic statics is not is is actually a very old technique that somehow has been a little bit forgotten, but that is now. Uh, I mean, now already the last 10, 15 years, making a very strong uh, revival uh, into uh, uh, into the field of uh, structural design. Uh, apologies. I just see that the door is open. Let me quickly close it.
really sorry about that. Um, so here you see some some so very early uh, uh, roots of graphic statics, even in the 1700s. And uh, you see that uh, in the beginning, graphic statics was actually developed in the context of understanding equilibrium systems. And so uh, more specifically, what you see is that you have here the geometry of this hanging chain, and then you have this, this diagram that we will be calling the force diagram. Uh, here in the dotted lines. And just to explain the core, uh, the core concept is that graphic statics allows you to, to compute, understand, visualize, and explore the equilibrium of a structure by actually um, uh, uh, drawing the equilibrium of all the nodes in uh, uh, using geometry. So more specifically, what we will have is that the force in an element in the structure is basically represented by uh, a, a, an element in the in the in the force diagram, and so the relation between these two diagrams. So the form diagram is is the is the, the is the geometry of the structure, and then the force diagram captures the equilibrium. And so you see that the force in this element here. Uh, is uh, uh, you can know what the magnitude of that force is by measuring the length of this, this element in the force diagram. And so this is a very easy, intuitive way now to, uh, to understand uh, the equilibrium in this system. And you already see here by this symbol is that these two lines are parallel in the form and the force diagram. But I'll explain this step by step in the next couple of slides. I'm excited that I get to teach at, at, at ETH because um, graphic statics got really formalized here by um, first Carl Kuhlmann and then his, um, his, uh, his, his student, uh, Carl Willem uh, Ritter. And what's maybe interesting is that the two of them are actually the first two deans of the School of Engineering here at ETH Zurich. And then another important person in the early days of graphic statics was Luigi Cremona. Uh, he was not at ETH. But so here you see some historic examples and uh, a book that I found very important, Bo, because he introduced a certain notation to make graphic statics more intuitive and more understandable. And um, uh, uh, But here what's interesting actually that this book was not called how to how to do graphic statics, but this book was called On the Economics of Construction in Relation to Frame Structures. And that's maybe an important aspect is that without even understanding graphic statics, if I tell you that if you now know that these lengths in the for force diagram are related to the magnitude of the forces, then you see for all these different trusses, with different, with the same loading cases, globally the same geometry, but a different inside uh, geometry of the forces, then you see that, for example, here in 88, for example, globally the magnitude of forces is larger because you see larger lengths. And then here for this deeper truss, you directly see in the force diagram that because the, the length of the elements are smaller, that you will have smaller forces in the system. So again, this is, this is uh, one of the reasons that graphic statics also was uh, developed in order to be able to, to, to evaluate different systems, but also many master builders in the past, as you see here with the original drawings uh, on the bottom, uh, for example, Gaudi used graphic statics to discover the shape of this, the very specific shape of these retaining walls that allowed these walls to be built in simple masonry. Um, um, Maurice Köchlin, the assistant, the engineer of Gustav Eiffel, used here graphic statics techniques to discover and to develop and refine exactly the perfect geometry of the Eiffel Tower or this beautiful bridge, a very, very early application of concrete uh, in, in, in civil engineering, uh, the specific geometry, and I will talk about this project in more detail later, but Robert Maillard uh, used also here, you see on the bottom, uh, the same graphic statics that I will introduce today uh, in order to, to find the geometry of this beautiful structure. So um, SS graphic statics is powerful uh, as well because it allows you to do very sophisticated structural design just using 
pen and 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 paper and 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 equilibrium tools and methods but of course now we don't have to do everything by hand and so uh, uh many people and then particularly also us have been developing methods to use graphic statics in an interactive environment to really explore parametrically uh, different kind of aspects. And so um, you can do this to, to, uh, to, to distribute or understand the distribution of bending moments here on the right to understand actually how arches work and, and how you can find different equilibrium solutions within arches. Um, I will talk about this example. You, you can use graphic statics to optimize a geometry to, for example, have constant forces in the bottom in the bottom chord, so in the red bottom uh, elements. Or uh, indeed, as I already mentioned, many of these master master builders in the past, uh, these these beautiful structures here, Pierre Luigi Nervis uh, factory. Uh, can be uh, were designed with such tools, and so we can now also explain and rediscover in very simple steps how these uh, sophisticated structures were designed. All right, but step by step, let's start with cables. So uh, to start with cables, I want to, uh, I think uh, a very good example that I use in teaching is to just use this very simple bridge. So it's a, a bridge with just one node, and we are going to hang this up. So one way to look at this, uh, this uh, any structure is to take different cuts. It's called to make free body diagrams or to look at the equilibrium locally. And why that is uh, a useful way to, to look at structures is because if the global structure is in, equi in equilibrium, then every single part of the structure should also be in equilibrium. So this is what you see here. Each time that you look at a part of the structure, here you cut through this element two here, for example. If you cut through this element, then you release an unknown force N2. And so the same unknown force, axial force along that element N2 is released here. And so you see, you can also look at the internal node here, and then you see that you have three unknowns. You don't know, we don't know yet what is the force in element two, what is the force, the axial force N3 in element uh, three, and what is the axial force in element one. So this would be a typical way to, to, to look, um, to look uh, at structures, but let's now see how we can use graphic statics to, um, uh, to, to understand the, the, the magnitude of forces in all these systems. So let's quickly go back. One step is very trivial, right? So you see here, if you take the, the cut here at the support, then you see that um, the, the load that is being applied here, this F, uh, this 12 kilonewton, uh, needs to be reacted by the force in the cable, the hanging cable, and uh, uh, cable one. And so that means that the axial force in cable one is N1 has to equal uh, 12 kilonewton. So that's maybe the first step. And then we can start to look at uh, the node here, right? Because then we know that this F1 is directly carried by cable one. So this is a very simple example, but you will see that if you systematically build up your structural systems with graphic statics, that it actually discovering any type of complex geometry is as simple as a few steps that I will show you now. So first let's introduce some conventions. So here on the, on the left, we always have uh, our form diagram. So in this case, it's only a subsystem. So it's a form diagram of the subsystem. And so what you see here, um, everything in the form diagram is also drawn to scale, but to scale of the, of the structure, of the geometry um, of, of the structure that you're looking at. Uh, but then on the right, we will use what is called a force diagram. And that one is also drawn to scale, but to an other scale, the scale of the force diagram is related to the magnitude of forces. So for example, uh, what you start with is you draw the loads. So here you see you have only one load that comes down, F, and then you draw it to the scale that you define. So for example, one centimeter is one kilonewton. So if this force is 12 kilonewtons, so this is then 12 centimeters, right? So you plot the first force, and the first uh, the, the the applied load the the applied load here 
is, uh, is, is a gravity load, is the weight of the bridge, is F. And so it comes down, it's drawn vertically, and the magnitude, the length of this element is 12 kilonewton. So then the next convention that we have is that we will construct our force diagram uh, by following a clockwise convention. So we go around the structure, around the node in clockwise. So that means that if you go clockwise, that you first have element one, which is F, which has the force F, then you have element two, and then you cross element three. So if you now translate this to the force diagram, then you see that indeed, if you go clockwise, you first have one, then you hit two. So at the end of the, the force that, com, uh, that corresponds to one, you draw a line that is parallel to two, and then you continue and then next, so you close the force by then the, la the last element is three. So through the beginning of your load line, you draw then a parallel line to element three. So that means that if you go indeed clockwise, you have one, two, three. And if you go clockwise, uh, if you follow the forces in your form diagram, then you see you come down with F, that is one. Then you have two, that is this line. And then you have three. And indeed, with just transferring this geometry from the form diagram to the force diagram, now you directly find for that force, you find that this is the force in element two, and this is the force in element three. And again, as I mentioned, because you draw the force diagram proportional to, uh, or is it's, it's drawn to a scale, and this scale is related to forces, you can just measure. Here the force in element two, which is 8.5, because if you measure this, then you will see that you have 8.5 centimeters and one centimeter is one kilonewton. And the same here on this side. You see, of course, that because we have a symmetrical system and a symmetrical loading case, the forces in these two elements are symmetrical as well. So that's how simple it is. So we just used, we transferred geometry from the force, form diagram to the force diagram to basically find the equilibrium of this node, uh, this node one ear here. The, and again, the equilibrium is given by the length, by this polygon of forces and the length of the forces is then the magnitude. But what we can add also still to the force diagram is we not only have the internal equilibrium, so the equilibrium around this node uh, one here, uh, Roman capital one, but we also find the global equilibrium. And in this case, the global equilibrium is kind of the same as the local equilibrium because it's such a simple system. You see indeed that if you here have two anchors, anchor A and B, so fun foundations A and B, because these are cables, the reaction forces that need to be provided by the, by the support here, are of course perfectly in line with the last element and the same here. And so what you see here, and sorry, this is really slowly step-by-step, step, but I think it's important to do it slow now because you will see that all the other systems in uh, next will all follow the same logic. And we will very quickly in this lecture already go to quite sophisticated kind of element. So we, here we have the equilibrium of the node is represented by this closed polygon, so this triangle here. But then you see that we also have global equilibrium. Globally, we know that independent of the interior structure, this F is being carried by A and B. And that you see indeed that it is the case because in the force diagram, you see that there is an other triangle of forces that the global applied load F is being re resolved, is being reacted by, by A and B, by support A and B. And so that means indeed that you also, this triangle is closed. So that means that globally, the forces are in equilibrium as well. Okay, so now that we have uh, established the relation between the form and the force diagram, we can start to use this for design. So for example, if you were to choose as a designer that I don't, I want a more shallow structure, so less deep. So we look then at this second solution. Then you see that, again, now without having to, to calculate anything, by just transferring these new parallel forces, you see that for the same applied load, because the geometry is more shallow, 
your forces in the cables will increase, right? So the cable two and three, and will increase as much as uh, you can again uh, measure this kind of load. Similarly, if you were to make the structure more uh, uh, deeper, so if that is an option, then you will see by just changing that, that geometry that you will reduce the forces in the system, right? So you already see one of the reasons why we teach graphic statics or why I believe graphic statics is a very good idea is because it allows you to directly relate your geometrical decisions in the form diagram as designer to uh, uh, what that means for the forces in the system. So let's look at some other situations. Let's say that you had this uh, this in oops, sorry, this initial design, but uh, maybe you notice on site that uh, this rock is, for example, fractured and you cannot put any anchor in, uh, in the place where you design. So if you then place, for example, the structure here, then again, by translating this new geometry, so basically, again, this line through element three here in the force diagram is parallel to the line three here. And then you directly see what happens to the forces. So this change of geometry results in a, a slightly reduced, a slightly increased um, compared to the 8.5 in the beginning, slightly increased force in element three and, and, and more significantly increased force in element 11. But instead of taking the force there, you could also have taken or put your cable here, right? That also would have been an option. And then again, using graphic statics, you can see what that means. It means that you significantly increase the forces in three and even more, uh, more than double increase the forces in element two. Of course, by the way, now looking at this here, this might not make too, too much sense, right? To have a cable structure that is pulling down in the same direction. That's probably why the forces uh, explode here a bit. But my point is, is that when you use graphic statics, you don't, you directly can see the results or the, uh, the effects of changing geometry in your forces. Okay, what I show here, by the way, is look here at the scale, is that the meaning of the force diagram is of course directly connected to the scale. So you see, this is the same equilibrium as this equilibrium. I just wanted to clarify again that um, here on the force diagram, the scale matters and specifically is related to the interleg equilibrium. So um, uh, one of the online resources that I will show uh, later is called Equilibrium. And Equilibrium is our teaching platform that we use to teach graphic statics. So on Equilibrium, you will find every single one of our lectures. You will find every single one of our exercises and solutions for the exercises. And you will find many of these interactive drawings that allow you to maybe uh, get some more insight in graphic statics. So I, re I recommend you to go check out this online resource if you're curious to learn more about graphic statics. But let's now continue. So we had this one node, very simple. Let's say that we now have a bridge that has two of those hangers. We could do the same. We could still do it step by step using um, uh, using method uh, node per node. But of course, that is uh, that is not graphic statics. But I'll show you nonetheless how you can how we can understand the the graphic statics technique. So if you look at one node, one node, uh, uh, the first one here, the, uh, the, the, the uh, node one, then actually you have the same situation as before, right? You just go around the node, you have first one, then you have two, and then you have three. So if you go around this node, you see again, you have one, then you have two, and then you have three. So the same to the node two. So you actually apply the same as what you had before. And then we can actually combine those two nodes because of course you see that when you look at all the nodes separately, you're kind of not using information that is there. And for example, that uh, when you look at the two nodes separately, then, then you have the two, uh, you see that they, 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 you can look at them separately, but actually that this element two here is combining the two nodes. And you see this very clearly in their two sub equilibria is that if you look at the equilibrium of the node on the, on the right, then you, so the first node here, then you have this equilibrium, this triangle. And if you look at the node uh, on the left, then you have this triangle, right? 
but because these two elements, these two uh, nodal equilibria have the same element two, you see that luckily they are in the same direction. Luckily they have the same length. And that makes sense because they are the same elements. So we can combine them in one diagram, which, which is the force diagram for this system. And so again, I want to highlight that in this force diagram, we see different things. We see in this triangle, the equilibrium of this node. We see in this triangle on the bottom, the equilibrium of the node on the left. And then we again see that globally, if we have all the applied loads, so F1 and F2, then those two together are being resulted, reacted by A and B. So we see indeed that we have a global triangle of the main forces, the applied loads, and the react reaction forces that are in equilibrium because they close, because indeed they form a closed polygon of forces. And each time we can close the forces, that means that we have equilibrium. So, okay, so this is actually, this was a bit of a weird way to look at the structure from a graphic statics point of view, but I hope that it's clear that actually where then this global force polygon comes Typically in graphic statics, we would directly start by drawing the load line first. So the load line is given by collecting all the applied loads. So going clockwise around the structure, you see that the applied load is first F1 coming down and then F2 going down as well because there are two gravity loads. And so you see, then you can plot this in the load line that you can draw anywhere on the force diagram. And so first load that is applied is F1 coming down, and then you have F2 coming down, and those two together make up the load line. So then you can use uh, the, the similar concept as, as I explained, is that you want to start to translate geometrically the information of the form diagram to the force diagram drawing parallel lines. So for example, around this node, you see that F1 is separated by three and two, so indeed you have three and two that make the equilibrium there. And then you can uh, transfer the last uh, missing element that is uh, the one uh, uh, parallel to five, that is the one that closes here. So parallel to five, you draw a line and then you see that you have to end three here at the end. So that is how we typically construct uh, the, um, the force diagram. And then you see that we can nicely uh, find the equilibrium uh, of uh, uh, all the forces, including the reaction forces in the system. Let's now again go back to the situation that we are designing and we would have a, one of the anchor locations that is not, uh, that is not suitable. So we have to relocate our, uh, our last tie. So again, we, we know that this is three. So let's draw this parallel line here to the last element three. So now what you see is that if you draw this line N, N3 here, you see that we have an issue. We see that the left geometry corresponds to these elements and the right, geom the right part, the new part is this. And so what you see is actually that these, uh, these elements don't come together in one point anymore. So I hope that you have been paying attention and you know then that that means that we don't have equilibrium. We don't have closed polygons of forces that represent nodal and global equilibrium. So that means that we need to reconnect a uh, structure. So this, this line here is given because that's the new geometry of three. And now we have to find the geometry in the bottom so that it actually matches, so that it comes together in one point so that we have equilibrium again. So we can do this by redrawing them in this point. And so what's now important though, is that, and you saw this here, is that this is then the starting point. And now we will discover the geometry of the left part that allows your element three to be exactly where you designed it. So here you see the three is given, and then we just connect the other elements and that gives us the direction of all the elements. So now we go the other way. We take the information of the force diagram and we apply this to the form diagram. So here you see that now N2 has this orientation, this direction. So we draw a line parallel to this direction here, going through this intersection point, and that gives us the direction of our element two. And then if you go to the next step, we of course add the hanger N4, 
And then we add the element here and we know what direction it has uh, by drawing it parallel to the element in the force diagram, right? Okay, so this, this you see, uh, before we didn't have to do that because we only had one node and one node just gives you one equilibrium. But in this case, we have mul multiple nodes that needs to be perfectly balanced. So what would happen, by the way, if you would not do that, if your node would not be in equilibrium, then you can build it, but then your structure will change and shift to find a new equilibrium under this new kind of loading case. Of course, that would not be ideal because then your bridge might be hanging down and not landing where it needs to be and so on and so on. Maybe uh, quickly here, because uh, you might uh, you might have wondered how I chose this point this point here to reconnect the element. This point can be anywhere on this line. Anywhere on this line will be a solution that basically has this element three where it is. So where to choose this point? Well, it could be it could be, for example, let's say that here the anchor that you want to a maximum force B at the end. So then you can apply this maximum force by constraining this length to be exactly the length equivalent to this maximum force. So that means that you can use a force idea to find the geometry here. Okay, something else that is important for later on is that another uh, I already hinted at this, right? But so if you take F1 and F2, then you see that the reaction forces A and B counteract is F1 and F2. F1 and F2, of course, means that they together, so if you go from the beginning of the load line to the end of the load line, that gives us the resultant of all the forces in the system. And so you see that because the resultant forms a triangle, with A and B, that also means that if we look at the force diagram, that if you look at the line of action going through B and a line of action going through A, where they intersect, that is where we have the resultant, right? Because anything that force forms a closed polygon of forces in the force diagram needs to be a system of intersection intersecting forces in the form diagram. So you see indeed that A intersects with B and that is exactly where the resultant of the forces, in this case, F1 and F2 are the same. So the resultant is in the middle of F1 and F2. But so what I wanted to show here is that you can also use the information of the force diagram with the lines of actions of the resultants here to basically find where the resultant of all the forces is applied. So that is the that last equilibrium that we have or that global equilibrium in, in our uh, form diagram that applies to loads. And then again here, um, I recommend you to go to the equilibrium drawing that allows you to basically explore this. But so the same is true when you have more hangers. Um, and and uh, here what you see is that for this very shallow solution, we have rather large forces for the applied loads. And if you were then to take a deeper solution, then you take the loads like this. But um, uh, that's also exciting about, about graphic statics is that actually um, it is a tool that doesn't allow you to just say like this structure will work or not, but it allow, allows you to discover the infinite possible different equilibrium solutions for the same loading case. So here you see that if we pick a, a different load that we find another, another equilibrium that corresponds to a deeper structure. And the only difference is that we have the same applied loads but that the horizontal component of the forces reduces again because we have a deeper structure. If we make it even deeper, then you see that the forces reduce again and then you would have some compression struts here instead of hangers but the same structural logic is true here. So um, you, can, you can pick up loads in different ways. You can take the main resultants, you can subdivide it end and end. And then of course, uh, if you subdivide it uh, very tightly, then basically what you have done, if you have found not only the geometry, but also the magnitude of the forces uh, in, the, in the cable, 
and I don't have time to go into this example, but I, I recommend you to go uh, uh, to uh, the, the interactive drawing that shows you step by step how the Golden Gate Bridge uh, was designed. And then after you switch mode, you can also explore different geometries and understand um, how this was done. All right, let's go to a first case study to actually show you how this can be applied then already in, uh, in a design session. So for example, for the, um, for the Tower Bridge in London, uh, the Tower Bridge in London has this very unique kind of geometry here on the side. And I, we will show, I will show you how this geometry was discovered. Maybe a first thing to introduce is that uh, how to go from this discretized version on the top if you have a continuous line load applied, so not separate loads applied at equal distances, but we have a continuous load, then actually the funicular geometry, so the, the geometry of the string of the cable will be a parabola, a perfect parabola. And in a parabola, we have a very unique kind of uh, geometrical property that is useful in design. So here on the left is the geometry and here on the right is the structural uh, interpretation. So when you take a par parabola and you connect the two endpoints here, we call this line here, by the way, the closing string. So this line here, then you will see that if you if you take the middle of the parabola, so the middle in the horizontal direction, then you see that here the middle, if you take, if you, the parabola will intersect if you, sorry, if you draw the tangents here at the end of the parabola, so the tangent solution at the end, uh, those will intersect at double the height of the parabola. So here you see F, the sag of the parabola is exactly double. So this is a very handy geometrical feature that we can use to quickly sketch, to quickly find the parabola, but also to directly find its equilibrium. And then you see also, by the way, that in the middle, the tangent of the parabola, so that means a tangent line to the midpoint here is basically parallel to the closing string, so the line that connects here. So you can now see that actually this makes sense from a structural point of view as well, because for the line load, the, the resultant of the parabola is applied in the middle, right? So that makes sense. If you lump all this load in one resultant, this would be in the middle. And indeed, uh, remember that we said that the reaction forces here, A and B, need to form a closed polygon of forces with the resultant. So that means indeed that if you, con if you continue the lines, the line of action of B and A, at that intersection, you have the resultant. And of course, what is B and A in a, in a, in a structural point of view? These tangents here, are of course the direction of the reaction forces at the supports. And as you remember before, these reaction forces need to intersect with the resultant. And that is why we indeed have uh, this relation, uh, how we can explain basically uh, with a structural intuition, the, the geometrical relations of the, the parabola. So using that, that's uh, let's then uh, we can then find uh, uh, the geometry of the of the forces um, under self weight, and you see that they actually go through the hinge, the middle hinge, and the other one. So this is a simple parabola. But so you see that this is a bit weird. That if we have the 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 the, the uniform load of the bridge, then you see that the forces actually travel somewhere in the middle of the geometry. So where is this geometry coming from? Well, the designers basically found the, 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 the equilibrium, so two parabolic kind of parts. This is a parabola and this is a parabola. And basically they looked at what happens when we have all the live loads on one end. So we have the self-weight plus all the live loads on one end. Then you will see, then you find this geometry. If you now have all the loads on one end, then you have this geometry. And so together, I'll show this here. So together, they make up this geometry. So if you have the load on the left, then the, 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 the hanging chain or the hanging structure is on the bottom here and on the top here. And if you have all the load on the, on the right, then it's on the bottom here and on the top here. 
right? So very elegant design. It actually shows the range of equilibrium solutions. And then when you just have the live loads, then you, the equilibrium is in the middle here with the dot lines. So um, let me quickly show you this. So there is a technique that allows you to find these uh, different equilibria. Of course, I don't have time to, 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 to go through here. But again, using graphic statics, this is for an engineering point of view, extremely difficult to do, but you can directly find the, trust, uh, the, the, the equilibrium solution that, that goes through these three points and that is uh, parabolic on both sides. So here as well, another interactive drawings, if, uh, drawing um, that shows how it was constructed, but also shows how to now compute um, uh, a, a, tr a force line, so in orange, that also includes this point load. And so you see that if you have any type of loading case, then you see how basically all these loading cases nicely fit within the geometry of the structure. So I will share the slides so that you can also look at the videos, but also uh, remember um, all these things are explained step by step in equilibrium, plus all our lectures are in equilibrium. Uh, because I realize I'm going a little bit too fast for you to understand everything step by step. Um, an interesting topic, which is a very different, uh, difficult concept, is the concept of pre-stressing. And this can be very easily shown using graphic statics. So what does it mean pre-stress? Pre-stress is a very interesting way to keep your geometry fixed. So here, actually, this is our geometry. This is our cable with the load applied, but the load is not here for the moment. So we find this kind of hanging cable. And in order to make sure that this cable doesn't move around when we have other loading cases, we add what is called pre-stress. So that is this element to the bottom. So here you see, even without any load applied, external load applied, we, we have already forces in the system and the forces come from the pre-stress load C. So see how is the pre-stress applied by having a shorter element here, by tightening it, by pulling at the support. So this is a typical way to apply pre-stress. So, but why do we uh, apply pre-stress? Let's look at this now in uh, 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 using the form diagram on the left and the force diagram to the right. So for example, if we now have a load that is smaller than the load that we designed for, then you see that here, if we have applied load, if we go clockwise again, then we see we have F, then we have B, then we have C, then we have A. So we see this here. If we follow these forces in the, in the form, uh, force diagram, then we go from F indeed, then B, then C, then A, right? So you can always clockwise follow the forces in the force diagram. So we have F, B, C, A. So you see that once you apply a load here to the element, uh, to this cable, these are all cables. Then you see that um, the what is this, this applied load is basically reducing the level of pre-stress because this element is being compressed a little bit, but because it was tensioned with a higher value, this, this level of compression results in a reduction of pre-stress in the system. So if we then increase the load, right? So we have the same form diagram, but we, we, the load is applied, but it's a bigger load. So we increase the load, then you see that it reduces the process even more. And then at a certain point, when we hit the, the, the load that this pre-stress system was designed for, so the maximum load that this pre-stress system was designed for here, that is the moment that this load cancels out the pre-stress. And then you see that we have zero force in this element. And then only from that point onwards, when we keep increasing the load beyond the load that the pre-stress system was designed for, then we see that this tension element is being put in compression. That is one thing. So it's not only zero force, but it would also buckle. It would show that uh, because a cable cannot take any compression but also then we would start picking up, we would start picking up um, uh, uh, forces in the system and this cable would start to deflect. So until this point, until this point, we have a perfectly, uh, until this point, sorry, until we still have pre-stress, 
there's absolutely no change in geometry, right? So that is super powerful with this pre-stress is that we keep the geometry entirely fixed because of this pre-stress load is uh, um, uh, uh, lower and only then we start to apply the load. So, but actually, if you think about it, what's very interesting about pre-stress is that it is actually a way to make a super light column because this is a column that works not just by carrying forces in compression, but by carrying forces in reduced tension. So, uh, and this is what you see here is that this tension column can take forces all the way until we um, uh, 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 um, hit the level of pre-stress. So that's the concept of pre-stress. Again, I don't know if you've ever had someone try to explain pre-stress, but now with graphic statics, we can very visually and very ni uh, nicely explain this pre-stress. But what's now cool about uh, the um, uh, about these techniques is that I'm showing you the base ingredients, but you can now start to combine them. Uh, uh, well, I'll show you many more, but you can start to combine them to develop already very sophisticated systems. So let's now say that this pre-stress here is not applied just by a cable coming down as what we had before, but by an other, by two cables spanning in the two directions. And you see that we are not doing this in one plane, but we are changing in 90 degrees. And so you see the two different systems are connected with this precess value. And then you see that their 3D equilibrium can just be unfolded into two 2D equilibrium. So that is what we have here. So this is another pre-stress. And then similarly, when we apply a load now on this system, the reason that this pre-stressed cable net, very simple cable net of one node, is not moving or can take uh, different loading cases is because here you see on the right again, now the pre-stress load is being applied here. And the this applied load, sorry, the applied load Q is here. And so you see that this applied load result, result, uh, uh, re, um, uh, has as a result that the pre-stress forces in C and D are being reduced, right? So they, you have the same equilibrium, but there is a reduced forces here in the system. And so this happens all the way until we um, uh, uh, use all the pre-stress. So when Q equals uh, P, and P was basically kind of divided by C and D. And, and only from that point, we start picking up load. So, but now what's cool is that this very simple system, we can now apply with two. So uh, remember, this is like our bridge, right? So this was a one node bridge. Now we have a two nodes bridge. And so instead of, uh, again, pulling down directly, we pull down with two kind of uh, elements that represent that are represented here with CD and EF. And we can build this up. So we can uh, go to multiple elements. But actually, then the next step is instead of just doing this for one element, we can have multiple cables and we can have multiple uh, stiffening cables that are pulling down. And that is exactly how you can now explain how a cable net works or a membrane structure works and how um, uh, and why it works to take different loading cases. And so more specifically, if you look at the interaction of the main cable here and the main cable here, their overlap is this pre-stress here. And so you see indeed that we have exactly the same idea and we could do exactly the same as what we were doing before to explain how the pre-stress how the priestess is allowing different loads to be taken without a change of geometry of uh, the main structure. But using graphic statics, we also see that why we want our cables to be following the curvature. Because if the, our cables would be straight lines, then we have an other equilibrium and, it, and you might say like, okay, well, this seems very similar to this. We just have the same equilibrium. That is true. In the perfect theoretical world, world, world without any loading, these two are both possible. But now we see that as soon as we apply a load in order to take this in reduced pre-stress, what you see now is that any load here, because these lines are are horizontal parallel, you see that the forces would need to be infinite in order to react to 
uh, or to resist this, this force Q. So that means that if your cables are not following the curvature and they are just straight lines, then you cannot take any load and then any applied load will directly result in theoretically infinite forces. So that means directly in a lot of deformation. And so that is also an interesting thing that we can now show very clearly using graphic statics, why we need positive or, or why we need good double curvature in membrane structures to carry the loads efficiently. And this you see here, this is a flat situation. You have straight lines in both directions. This is a flat structure and a flat structure cannot take any additional loads uh, efficiently as a cable net. Okay. So now that we started with cables, let's go to arches. Actually, arches I can show you in one slide because if you understand cables, then you can flip the loads and, and, and you see we also flip the, the structure to the other side. And then you see that the equilibrium or the shape of a cable uh, in pure tension is the shape of an arch in pure compression. And so then we can use similar kind of ideas as before. That again, in the force diagram to the right, you see that if we have a, a very shallow structure, then for the same applied loads, and, and again, how this structure was found is that this element is parallel to this element, this element is parallel to this element, and so on, this element to this. And so that's the relation between the two. That is how this shape was found by choosing a pole, by choosing this point and then connecting all these elements, or the other way around, uh, this force diagram explains the equilibrium of the forces in this arch. And so you see that if you have a more shallow structure than, uh, than a deep structure, the only thing that, difference, uh, that differs is, of course, the horizontal magnitude of forces. So this is how you can explain these beautiful structures that have been standing for centuries. And what's interesting about these thicker structures is that you can imagine different compression only uh, what is called thrust lines within this geometry. And uh, this means that for these arches, we can actually have different force flows. So different compression force flows that fit inside of these geometries. And all of these are possible solutions. The only, uh, 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 the only thing that, that we notice is that in real historic structures, like here, for example, in, in, this, uh, in this cathedral in Vézelay, we see that actually um, the geometries might settle and deform after time. And then you create these hinge lines, these points where we know that the compression forces go through. Uh, but again, I don't have enough time to talk about all of this, but uh, historically people have been using graphic statics to understand or to develop the geometry of forces. So for example, here, this is an interesting one. This is in Mallorca. This, uh, this uh, uh, when you look at the church of Mallorca, it's a super high uh, church and these columns look extremely thin and you wonder how is that possible? But of course, that is a trick that the designers did because here you see on the right, the photos, when you, when you go inside on top of the vault, you see that here, the, the master builders, the, the masons back then, put all of this extra weight. So here you have additional big uh, stones that are put, uh, put all the way on top of the structure. And what that gives you is that it changes the loading case so that you can have a more shallow, a more pointed solution because you have an extra load here on top. And this more pointed solution, so it's less round, it's less parabolic, it has this kink, this kink in the middle, this kink actually allows the truss line to be much more vertical and to fit within this geometry here. Of course, also the help of the flying buttresses helps to kind of balance these loads and to create this horizontal, uh, this, this more vertical kind of force in the column. So this, all of this can be explained with graphic statics. And again, if you are interested in this, go to our lectures because there, uh, that are online at in equilibrium. That's where I explain step by step how all of this works. Um, but with with now these simple tools that we have, we can also explain how why the master builder uh, Gustav Eiffel designed this beautiful bridge 
uh, shaped like a crescent, like a, like a, a croissant. Um, and so this, you can see that basically this comes from if you have, uh, so if you have two hinges here at the, at the bottom, if you take all kind of possible loading cases and you trace all of them on both sides, then you will see that the envelope, so the bounding box of solutions is exactly this, this, this uh, crescent shape, this moon shape that you have in the structure. Similarly, but a little bit more constrained, this is a structure that has one. Here, this is actually cut, so two, oops, two and three hinges. So this is a statically determinant structure. And also there, you can use graphic statics to discover all the different truss lines to, that go through one, two, and three hinges. And that is exactly what Maillard used uh, into a structure. By the way, interesting that he used compression solutions to find the geometry of his structure. And the reason was that this in, in 1920, uh, this was one of the earliest constructions in concrete. And so he wanted to make sure Maillard understood that concrete is actually like an artificial stone, what I have been arguing and explaining in my first lecture. So he wanted to find all of the loads for every loading case had to stay within the geometry of his concrete. And so that is why he wanted to find this geometry. And you see here, by the way, also the, the section, he, he realizes this structural depth with an extremely thin uh, walls on the side. So he needs, he wants the structural depth, but he doesn't want all the mass. So a similar logic as uh, what I uh, explained, how we built a striatus bridge, for example. And so, by the way, look, only three centimeters of unreinforced uh, of uh, mildly reinforced concrete, so very exciting. Also here we have graphic statics drawings, uh, uh, interactive graphic statics drawings on the equilibrium platform that allow you to rediscover, redesign like you were Maillard, um, this, uh, this bridge. And also here, like we have for the tower bridge, you can see that if we have a loading case that is the self-weight plus an implied and applied uh, point load, that you find all the solutions on the inside. All right, let's continue. So um, uh, another beautiful stiffened structure, the arch was, uh, this is by the famous Peter Reis in a Coor, it's the Coor train station. So the, uh, the bus station in, in Coor in Switzerland, when you go skiing in the mountains, you, you pass by this beautiful bus station. It's a beautiful arch that is designed using graphic statics. But then it needs a stiffening scheme for different loading cases. So in this case, the stiffening scheme is using pre-stress. And so again, how it works is that uh, intuitively, if you load the geometry on one end, then you see that these cables go into tension because they basically are catching the geometry, right? So globally, the deformation of the arch would come down here and go up here on the other hand. So that means that these cables are being stretched and these cables are being compressed, right? But that is not what we have. We actually have a, 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 an arch with a tension tie. So here you see that the tension tie resolves the horizontal forces. And so compared to here, by the way, what is different is that here we had two hinges, two hinge uh, support. So here, in order to have a tight arch, you have a hinge support on one end, and you have a roller on the other hand, right? So that you can activate this tie. So that means that your reaction forces will be perfectly vertical in this case. So when you have these perfectly vertical loading cases, so then, then you, you uh, that is because the horizontal forces are taken by the cable and the magnitude of force in the cable can directly be measured here in the force diagram. It's of course the connecting the pole to the load line. So, but now we don't have a straight line in the core case, but we pull this load line uh, with this, uh, this tension tie up by, uh, in order to connect the stiffeners, but also by actually pulling the straight tension tie from its straight, you actually put a natural pre-stress into the system. And so this you can also do nicely with the force diagram. Again, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to explain how step-by-step step you can uh, construct this, but uh, there is references there. But then once you have this pre-stress, then you see that a similar applied load allows you to keep all the cables in tension 
and the, the arch nicely stiffened so that it would not buckle or become unstable under live load cases. And now I just want to show a few steps to show that actually with already these 2D cases, you can start to now turn this into the real project. So this arch is not one arch, but it's two arches that are leaning. That, that means that we have to add these tension elements. And so then you add also the stiffening scheme in 3D. Then you add these, these two elements, but then in order to make the structure more interesting, instead of just having columns here, what, that, what Peter Rich then did is that he added a little additional hanging piece that we can have a, a nice column in the middle that is hung from the two sides. And then of course you need a, an additional compression strut here. And so that is that allows basically this structure also to be at the end, to be nicely elegant and almost floating uh, with, with a cantilevering bit here. Uh, so uh, this simple example to show that, that with graphic statics, you can step-by-step step build up quite sophisticated structures. Also, for example, this beautiful distribution center uh, for Renault by uh, Norman Foster. If we look at this project, then we see this extremely lightweight, efficient roof that offers a total open space for the factory. And so if you look at this structure, then you see that actually you have both a hanging cable and a standing arch and half of the forces is being transferred. And so half of the forces is taken by the arch and half of the forces is taken by the hanging cable. So you see this, right? So you see um, uh, half of the forces here is taken in compression to the next element. And then we have a combination of a compression element and a tension element always taking the load. So compression, tension, half is taken in compression, half is taken in, in tension. And you see this here, right? So if you see this piece is half of the force and this piece is taking half of the other vertical force. So that is maybe the first subsystem. Okay, I'll skip this. And then you can add these cantilevering bits which are added here. Uh, again, I don't have enough time, but it's it's really simple. You can just note per note follow the same logic. You go clockwise, you check if something is in compression and tension, and then you can combine the two systems here as well. That is then to explain this hanging, this global hanging cable here. And if you then combine them, then you see that you have the two directions. But then you can, instead of having them come together in one point, which would give you some complicated details, but which also uh, here they wanted an opening in the middle. So instead of this, we can just open the system again and pick up the loads like that. And so again, you could build this up with simple form and force diagrams to then uh, distribute the forces. Instead of just having one cable, you can split it up in two cables in order to. Um, to add stability to the system. And then you can add the simple scheme on the end. So you, you superpose these two elements. Here in the middle, you take these loads. Here on the side, you take these loads. And then basically combined, you have basically explained uh, the equilibrium of all the elements, key elements in this elegant high-tech roof of, the, uh, of uh, Norman Foster. So then uh, an, an, an additional case study uh, is the Waterloo station where uh, here, uh, because, of, uh, the, the, um, uh, because of the trains here on this side, they could not have a simple funicular solution. So they had to deviate from this solution. And you can use this deviation from the solution to, uh, to basically find how much you want to compensate this deviation of the compression strut with the tension solution on the other hand. And that then explains nicely the equilibrium of the, of the Waterloo station. And again, because I don't have time, there is a step-by-step -step, uh, interactive drawing that explains how this rebalancing of the equilibrium is done using graphical methods. So this you can nicely see. But the same scheme, by the way, is used not just for Waterloo, but also for the Berlin train station, also for uh, actually the Zaha did a ski jump in Innsbruck. So all these different structures are done interactively. By the, he, by the way, here you see that if you were to design a geometry that absolutely doesn't make sense, then you get all of these uh, explosion of forces. All right, trusses. 
sorry, I promised you in the beginning that there is a lot of material. Uh, I'm uh, giving you a lot of insights. It will take you a little bit of time. So please go back to the slides, go back to the online resources to, uh, to take a bit more time to go step by step. But I just wanted to show you how actually graphic statics is powerful. Our graphic statics is very uh, consistent and very systematic and so that you can build up uh, knowledge. Our graphic statics can be used to not just look at 2D cases, but when you start to smartly combine 2D cases that you can explain quite some beautiful projects and 3D kind of systems. And uh, so here we are building up. So we looked at the equilibrium shapes, the, the hanging shapes, the compression shapes and so on. So let's now look at shapes that are not pure equilibrium uh, forms like trusses and beams. So um, in this case, uh, we have, again, the boundary conditions. We will have a simply supported situation, a hinge on one end and a roller on the other hand. And we want to take our load here, our applied load in the middle. So uh, by the way, on the top, you will always have a compression only solution. Uh, no, the, the compression solution and then kind of the tension solution on the bottom. So if we look at this problem, we can, we can actually do this in a sequence of funicular systems. So here, if you see this first load, then you take it in compression with a simple arch. The simplest arch is, of course, a triangle here. Uh, is you go down in compression, compression, and then you need a tension tie. But of course, this load is then supported with two reaction forces. And equivalently, here on the bottom, this load is hanging in tension and tension, and then we have a compression strut. But then we can also this instead of because we don't have the reaction force here, we want to hang it up. Oops, sorry, hang it up. And when we pull here, we're also pulling here. So the load that this structure feels, so the second one has Q2 pulling down here and Q2 pulling down here. And so again, this is a pure funicular system. So you see compression, 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 and then you have one tension type, right? So again, another system and then you if you add then you see that again because we don't have a support here we need to pull it up pull it up with what amount with q2 and then that means that we're pulling down here with q2 and that gives you an other pure funicular system because the loading of this one here is this force and this force so basically why i did this is this explains why a truss is so efficient as a structure because it's actually an overlay of different kind of pure funicular systems. And that makes a truss so efficient indeed. And so, but what you also see is that uh, basically the, the magnitude of forces here in the horizontal here at mid span will be, uh, uh, and, and that also on the bottom in the core the forces accumulate because you overlay all these different funicular kind of systems. All right, so another way to look at a truss is to first do the global equilibrium, the global equivalent for this truss, and is to show that actually naturally this force would want to flow here and here, and then it has one tension time. And so what you do in a truss then actually is that you're splitting the loads. So this compression strut is split in two tension struts with a and, and then because you split it, you need to add a tensile kind of uh, vertical. And that is, again, what happens when you subdivide it differently. Then instead of having this element is split again into two and the splitting results into an additional element that is being added. So this is an other way to explain the struts, but you see again, how then uh, here you have continuous tension, global tension, and this tension is being reduced by this additional uh, by this compression that comes here. Of course, this is intuitively this is explaining using graphic statics why a truss is so efficient. But let's now use graphic statics to understand all the forces in the system. So if we apply a load, uh, so if we uh, so we would have loads, for example, applied to all the nodes on the truss. But the first thing is to use graphic statics to find the reaction forces. And for this, we can find any, any global triangle because any, uh, regardless of the geometry of forces, remember the very first example of the bridge, regardless of the specific geometry of your, of your structure, 
globally, your reaction forces, of course, need to be the same because your loading case doesn't change. So how to find the reaction forces is to use the resultant of all the applied loads and then to find an equilibrium system that actually brings these loads to the support. And so you see that is what we did here. So we find a simple arch by drawing parallel lines again, and that gives us then the magnitude of A and B. But if we now go step by step, you can see that every time, like we did before, to the next node, you, so the next node, what we have, we have A, then we have the element, we have this load. So around this node, we have A, the applied load, this element and this element, if we go clockwise. So we have A, which goes up. Then we have the applied node on the first node, which goes down. Then we have the horizontal. And then we have the tension force, right? So this is what you can do for every node. You can go around the node and then co collect and construct a force diagram one by one. And that is actually how you then find the force diagram of all the forces in the system. Uh, something else that you will notice that is that uh, the, the element that represents this element actually becomes just one point here at the top. So uh, we have uh, uh, zero forces in that element. And again, on the top and the bottom, you have the compression and the tension equivalent. Sorry that I'm going a little bit faster, but the key thing is, and I showed you this with the first node, is that you go clockwise again very consistently, and then you draw parallel lines in the force diagram and you, compl you uh, complete your diagram. And that allows you then to, to basically, that allows you to then uh, 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 discover the forces, but also explore them. So this is, uh, this is again, a step-by-step -step kind of uh, um, interactive drawing that you can go to in graphic static, uh, in equilibrium to look at. So here, um, we already talked about these kind of things, right? That uh, if you have a, a deeper solution altogether, then uh, your forces are reduced compared to a shallow solution. This is a key, a key concept in structural design, right? To reduce the internal forces in the system, you want to increase the structural depth. So the same is true for trusses, right? So the same topology of the force diagram, but because of a different geometry, you see that a deeper truss for the same applied loads, right? Because you see the load line is the same. This load line is the same as this load line. So for the same applied loads, the forces in the deeper truss will be smaller than the forces in the more shallow truss. All right, so let's quickly look at a, a nice case study by Maillard where he uses actually the relation between the form and the force diagrams to discover the most efficient truss uh, for a specific property that he was interested in. This project is in Chiasso, that is the last train station in Switzerland before you go into, before you enter Italy, when you take the train from, from, uh, from Zurich to Milan. And so basically uh, what Maya was interested in is can I, because he wanted to optimize his structure. And by the way, this is a concrete roof of, of uniform thickness. And he wanted really to activate this concrete as well as possible in uniform, uniform kind of compressive stresses. And so what Maya did was, uh, okay, so this drawing here shows that if you take a bit more time to look at the relation between those two diagrams, then you will see that the elements in the force diagram that correspond to the straight elements here of the roof are basically these lines, right? So this element corresponds to this. So is the force in this element. The yellow is the force in this element. The green is the force in this element and then equivalently on this side. So in order to basically get the forces in these elements to be constant, you see this already, you want to basically make them all the same length. So that is the start of your construction in your force diagram. And then you will strategically connect all of these elements to go to those points that you defined. And that defines the very specific geometry of this bottom chord. And then you add the verticals. And so what we just did is by actually and you see here, this is not the case. Here, this element is longer than this element is longer than this element. So they all have a different length in this case. 
So if we construct a truss differently and we give them all the same length, then you see that by giving them a same length, then we have the same force in all of these top elements. So Maillard basically started from this in his drawing to discover the geometry of this very specific bottom chord. And now you can explain this very nicely, and this is summarized also in this element, is that if you were to have a, str a straight roof here, which would be bad maybe for rain and snow and so on, then this straight roof, if you look at the force diagram, all the elements of the straight roof are constant force, right? And then the geometry of the cable is, of course, the one that we recognize. But if your roof wants to be a pitched roof, you still can have constant forces in all the elements by making sure that all these elements in your force diagram, that you draw them uh, to be parallel to what they have to be, but you also draw them to have the same length in the force diagram, and then you reconnect these elements to discover the geometry of the bottom chord that gives you exactly constant force in the top kind of element. And again, this is a very powerful way to use the information in the force diagram to discover an, a, a form diagram that achieves a very specific force concept. And so again, uh, please go to equilibrium to kind of discover this step by step and also to explore the different parameters that you then can have. But of course, you can then generalize this. In this case, this is an other construction where, not, where we're not asking to have the top court to have co uh, uh, constant force. But in this case, we're actually asking the bottom geometry to have a constant force. Because for example, you want to, this to be a, cons, a continuous cable that is being stretched with the same amount so that you really use this element fully. And because all of these elements are represented by these radial elements, you see what happens here, right? Is that you constrain them to all intersect with one circle. And this one circle means that all these elements will have the same radius so that these, and these elements correspond to the forces in this element, uh, in the bottom, in the bottom chord. So here, even if you have a straight element, you see what that means? It means that all your verticals can no longer be vertical, but have to be inclined a little bit that you get here. So this one is parallel here. This one is parallel here, right? So this inclined geometry you discover from the force diagram. And you also see that you can apply this to any kind of geometry. So for this geometry to be nicely in compression plus this bottom in constant tension, that is the construction here, right? And so you can apply this to all kinds of geometries. There's a nice paper by Lawrence Lachauer that uh, shows this. He did this use, uh, using some uh, uh, custom made. You can also make these tools yourself, custom made kind of uh, grasshopper tools to discover these structural forms. And again, there, please go to the, the equilibrium drawing to uh, 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 find these, these solutions. And you will see now if we ch change the ratio, the radius of the circle, we also, uh, so this will come later. If we change the radius of the circle, then you will globally change the magnitude of forces in the system. Ah, oh, no, sorry, that's not in this drawing. All right, so beams, we can, uh, we will have to go a bit faster, but actually you can look at beams as as materialized trusses. And so that allows you to use everything that I showed you before also to understand beams, right? So here you see the beam on the left. You can basically imagine kind of a, a, a funicular, a compression, a strut and tie, like a truss system on the inside. And so uh, everything that I've shown you before can now also be used for beams. Um, I ran out of time a little bit here. Dependent on the material system, you might want to use more a cross than, than, uh, than a direct funicular system. So in, in steel, you have compression tension capacity. So you rather use crosses in your system. But also, again, uh, I'm just giving you an overview. It's impossible to teach you everything about graphic statics in an hour and a half. But uh, uh, go to all the lectures uh, that we have online if you're interested in also using graphic statics to optimize your beams to, for example, uh, uh, discover how you can how how you can lay different reinforcement strategies. Um, you can use the global graphic statics to also know 
where you can make holes in your structure. So for example, in, in a beam here, you see that the natural flow of forces wants to be this arch. And so you have this opening that creates here, but here you have a combination between inclined compression forces and tension forces. So that's why you actually need the material. So you don't want to make holes in a beam here towards the support, but you can make holes nicely in the middle. Uh, if you have a cantilever, this changes, then you see that uh, uh, you have some other kind of uh, challenges and so on. But this you can generalize. You can actually look at, at strut and tie systems to pick up different loads and to kind of redirect the forces internally, for example, in reinforced concrete. And uh, that we see beautifully happening in this case study in two, where the, the amazing structural engineer Cecil Balmond uh, provided these elegant structural solutions for REM colas to make this structure literally fly. But if you look at this structure, then it starts from a very boring kind of plate with simple beams supported on two ends, then it would look like that. But you can now move the columns to have not only a main arch, but to combine it with kind of a cantilever. And then they are combined into one continuous uh, tension tie. And then you can start to shift the boundary conditions by placing them a little bit inside outside. So you see here, so that kind of breaks up the symmetry so that you don't see, uh, you almost don't recognize anymore that it's being supported. And particularly not because on the other hand, you shift to the other side. And then one more step that is being done instead of uh, supporting from below, it's hung from the top. And so here you see in all the different uh, side views, you see the different diagrams, super clean, super simple graphic statics diagram that explain this, this totally sensational, beautiful project, right? So this is, again, I went a little bit fast, but if you look at these slides again, when I will share them with you, then you will see that actually all these different steps I already covered. We already went through together and you can explain very simply, very rationally, how this, this project that looks like it's magic, that it's flying, is actually following some very clean, simple structural logics uh, going from one side to the next. Cool, no? Um, and so then you get, so here, uh, the, uh, you have a com column on one end, and then the imbalanced column is then being taken by a tension tie on this end, so that basically it looks like you have no column standing on that end at all. So here, a summary, summary of the different moves from a global, simple kind of like a table structure to a cantilevering table, then kind of uh, uh, replacing this like this, picking up the load so that you can start to shift in two directions. And then on one, one end, you keep this, this kind of asymmetric, weird kind of balance. And on the other hand, you kind of go hang it to the other side. So very beautiful case study here uh, by uh, uh, um, uh, Cecil Balmond. Another spectacular uh, uh, exa example is by Christian Keretz with my colleague uh, here at, at ETH, uh, Josef Schwartz, a spectacular engineer. If you want to become a, a magician of forces, check out his work. And so this project here uh, was uh, also a very similar skill scheme instead of kind of uh, supporting things typically. Look what they did. You actually, this beam doesn't need the structure in the middle. You can actually take this just with two flag walls here. And so the tension extends and the, ten and the compression here in the middle. So these two cantilevers are taken like that. And then on top of that, they start to shift this by activating the floor plates. So you see here that um, in order to not be symmetric and to move direction, the floor plates, you've built an additional uh, uh, pure, uh, pure funicular solution in the floor plates. So that is here, this kind of geometry. And that allows you to basically start to shift geometries. And then base one step is missing here is what Josef then does on top is to actually work with the different layers. So sometimes you have uh, uh, one of these elements is in one floor and then on the, the other floor, the element is on top and, and actually the slab is hanging from the other floor. And that allows them to make these kind of situations where you wonder where did the structure go? But so you see that partially the structure is supported from below and here it's hanging from the top. And then these you have these weird kind of instances, but total, total beautiful balancing. 
a much more detailed exploration of this structure you find again in our lectures. This you find in Structural Design 3 when you go to the Equilibrium platform. Another spectacular roof, 80 meter spans. How is this possible? And again, this was again by Josef Schwartz. This is possible because he hangs these kind of these little walls here with globally a tension cable here running in three and uh, a compression strut here going in the floor plate uh, in the total in the in the top roof and that allows to give these additional supports here in the middle to split up this large span and to achieve this span but again uh, and this is using graphic statics in practice, right? So Josef Schwartz uses graphic statics in practice to discover this kind of equilibria. And then of course, these specific equilibria are then realized uh, directly into the geometry of the post-tensioning cable. So you, you recognize, right, the compression strut and then the beautiful tension kind of solution here. So very clean, very simple graphic statics to achieve something absolutely spectacular. And this is then here you see what then these, these little uh, walls here. And by the way, these columns are only here to carry the roof. This has nothing to do with the large uh, spanning structure. Okay, I will skip frames because it's, uh, it's a similar kind of idea. It's redirecting forces. Um, I also added for you a, an entire section on the relation between thrust lines and bending moments. This is super interesting. Uh, it actually shows that you can relate trust lines to the bending moments in very sophisticated and complex structures. And I'm skipping through it right now, but I give you the slides. And if there's questions, we can come back to this in another session. Uh, and then to finalize, because I know that otherwise, uh, Philip, uh, Philip Yuan uh, would be disappointed if I don't move from 2D to 3D. I just wanted to give you one hint of uh, graphic statics in 3D. Uh, and uh, this is indeed the work of TNA, uh, my own PhD work, where I used uh, graphic statics in a horizontal projection of forces. So the same relation of the force in this element is, uh, is the length, uh, is the magnitude of force is the length here, the direction is if parallel. So we do this in these force diagrams, and that allows you basically to implant redirect and understand the horizontal equilibrium of a three-dimensional kind of uh, geometry. And so the relation is again the same, right? That the equilibrium, horizontal equilibrium of the forces here is represented by a closed polygon because all these polygons are connected. Remember, that means that we also have global equilibrium. So this system is globally in horizontal equilibrium and then a very simple a uh, solver so solves for the for the uh, 3D uh, trust network, and that allows also then in plan to redistribute forces to understand horizontal forces to redistribute them to find different equilibrium states and so on. So I just wanted to make this quick link because now you're not quite masters yet of graphic statics, but you know the basics, and hopefully that will help you also to understand the ideas behind. Rhino Vault, where we use form and force diagrams to manipulate and understand the horizontal equilibrium of more sophisticated structures. And that allows you then to, in a very controlled way, to discover all kinds of uh, systems uh, going from the Armadillo Vault that I talked about briefly to uh, the beautiful structures that Philippe Yuan is, is uh, doing with his team. Uh, in, in, um, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Shanghai and other places. Uh, so Rhino Vault 2 is a tool that allows you, this tool is an extension of Compass. And as I told you last week, um, uh, the third lecture will be given, given by the mastermind behind Compass, Tom van Meele. And we will basically show you how you can start to implement uh, your own tools, how you can start to make uh, a, a very kind of robust environment. And so we will also touch on Rhino Vault, but also on Form Finder, also, also on interactive graphic statics, on Compass uh, CRA, which allows you to do uh, rigid block equilibrium models and so on. And then as promised uh, here, the last slides, these are some key resources, online resources where you can continue to learn. Equilibrium is our teaching platform where you can find all my teaching material, all the exercises and all the interactive drawings. We have one specific class that might be of interest to you, 
which is called computational graphic statics. And sorry, this is a specific link that is only accessible to our students, but so I'm sharing it to you as well. Uh, we have a very cool tool, which is called interactive graphic statics, which allows you to interactive, make interactive drawings in Rhino and to explore graphic statics from yourself. And of course, there is Rhino Vault 2, and lastly, Compass as a last online resource, but more on this uh, next week. So um, I hope this was not too crazy. Um, I, uh, I guess the lecture was recorded, so you can go back to it. It was a lot of input overload. But uh, Philippe, I hope that you this is useful and starts as a good starting point for graphic studies. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, more than 200 slides. <laughs> it's, uh, maybe uh, too many to the students. Yes. Uh, yes. Actually, sorry, so, so, sorry yeah. students. I, I hope that this, <laughs> this is inspiring, motivating, and this helps you to get going. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, great. I think uh, graphic statics to me, I think, uh, spent almost like two years to to totally understand the initial logic. And actually, I think it's as deep as your imagination because if you go through three dimensional graphic statics, a lot yeah. of um, things. Uh, actually, my my team also have a PhD student here, uh, uh, Zhou Xinjie. He actually uh, start uh, to make uh, research on three dimensional graphic statics. Yeah. I would like to uh, give the last uh, two minutes to Xinjie. Do you have any question directly? Directly ask uh, um, to Philip. Xinjie, are you here? Yeah, 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 I'm here. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, I can hear. Yes, I, I have two questions and and, and thanks for uh, Professor Philip for your wonderful lecture. And um, the first question is, many factors can affect the structure of building, for example, earthquakes, uh, wind, and so on. And how do graphic statics cope with this? And what yep. are the challenges yeah. when applying graphic statics to practical activities? architectural design and how yep, to deal yep. with such challenges. And my second question is, how are connection nodes and the material systems considered for structural design with graphic statics? Because uh, graphic yep. statics itself uh, do not, do not uh, con consider this. Thank you. Yes, yes. OK, great. Um, I, I Maybe to your first question, uh, your second question first quickly, because the, the key thing is, I mean, overall to get your structural logic correct, right? And, and, and to shape your structure and understand the forces. And so that is what you can do with graphic statics. And then you need to translate these abstract lines into a material system. And so I didn't, I didn't have enough time uh, at the end because again, you cannot show everything in, in one and a half hours, but then you, you want to, for example, in concrete, then uh, uh, this continuous element in compression needs to be thickened with respect to the stress of the concrete. And then you want to kind of make sure that, that, that you have these compression struts in your concrete structure. On the other hand, the tension elements become being aligned to the reinforcement in the concrete. If you work in, in, in timber, then of course you could use graphic statics to maybe design a structure that counts mainly on compression connections because the more tension connections you have in timber, they're hard to make. You need to embed steel connections and so on. So maybe you can use graphic statics to discover geometries for your loading cases that are more aligned to different kind of uh, systems. So what I'm trying to say is that with graphic statics, it's a very powerful tool to make sure that you're your, your global scheme makes sense first, and then you need to materialize your system and you need to think and, and, and but, but again, what I showed you is that with graphic statics, you can explore if something is in compression or tension and you can see also the distribution of, of loads in the system. So um, it, it's just to say like, yes, you don't take the material constraints directly into account, but nonetheless, perhaps you can look at our lectures in Structural Design 3 on Equilibrium, because that those lectures show actually how you also can use graphic statics to design a connection in steel or to design a sophisticated connection in, in concrete using the same methods, but then zooming in onto the element, right? So you, it's, it's actually a very consi consistent kind of strategy. Okay, then... Um, um, 
your first question on earthquakes and dynamics and so and wind loads and so on. So there as well. So a graphic statics can be used in different ways. It can be, and I showed both. It can be used to discover a form, and it can be used to analyze a form. So basically, you can apply any other loading case onto your geometry to basically see what is the distribution of loads under, for example, wind. If you want to do seismic, of course, that's a dynamic effect. So dynamics you cannot do with graphic statics, but what you can do is you can tilt gravity so that you basically have an inclined load that combines horizontal and vertical kind of loading. And, di and this is a very typical way to get a sense a little bit of um, uh, your, your resistance to uh, 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 an, an earthquake load. Like a, it's, it's called a static equivalent load system for an earthquake load. So uh, to answer your first question, um, I actually don't see an issue of graphic of using graphic statics in practice because if if you actually use it both to discover a good form and you use it to make sure that you can that you can take all your loading cases through an appropriate stiffening scheme right then 85 90% of your of your problem is solved and then the rest will be done with, uh, then the engineer will take over and do some simple and FE analyses and will tell you, wow, this is a great structure. And that is what we have with all our structures is as, and that actually, if you start well, then you will not be surprised later on. And so I would say graphic statics is very practical and actually very amazing, famous engineers, uh, inspirational engineers like Bill Baker, for example, the, the the, the, the designer of the Bush Khalifa, the tallest building of the world. He uses graphic statics in all his projects to optimize the structure because you can, you can really save tons and tons and tons of material by, by just these simple checks, these simple uh, tricks to make sure that you're, uh, and it might be you just change your member a little bit, right? And if you don't know this, if you just draw your truss and a truss, anything triangulated works, right? But so if you, through graphic statics, find out that if within this truss, this member, if you move it a little bit, you save 20 tons of steel on your structure. That is very, very relevant in practice. So that makes graphic statics so, so useful, so exciting. Even by real famous designers, they use it because um, actually their fee will be bigger if they can save more material. So it makes a lot of sense, yes. Okay, that's great. I think um, uh, time almost up. Um, uh, still, we have one more uh, lecture from Philip Black's team. And yep. uh, uh, the last thing I want to mention, um, because we have a collaboration with uh, BRG in Shanghai, I think the project is going on fantastically. And I would like to update um, the information because um, the basement almost finished and um, the 120 oh, wow. span structure we we'll start and uh, we implement uh, 3D printing as the mode and actually that's a fantastic um, project. So I would I would like to to say next year probably our new collaboration will be um, constructed. I think it's fantastic. Oh. Uh, it will oh, be. That is crazy. Yes, we, we'll have <laughs> we'll... To, we'll have to follow we'll have to follow up on this, Philip. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yes, yeah. I, I think it's to totally know. based on the theory. Uh, based on the lectures and the, the knowledge yeah. uh, we teach today. And also the good news is the Shanghai Museum will have a branch um, a Matworks Museum in this space. So I, then the, the, the program, the function in it will be also fantastic. Oh, wow, 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 <laughs> yes. So yes, uh, nice, nice, uh, nice. we will okay. update uh, the information to you in the near future. Thank you so much yep. for today's yep. lecture. Thanks, Thanks again everybody. and see you next week. Thanks everyone. Yes, yes, yes. see you. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.